So you're back from your architectural photography shoot and you have a batch load of photos that you need to get processed and back to your client as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So in this video tutorial, I'm gonna share with you my approach of how I quickly turn around my photos and get them back to my clients. So we're not looking at high-end post-production techniques that are quite time consuming. The goal is to get our photos looking as good as possible in as short a amount as time as possible. So this way of working is great if you're doing the type of photo shoots that require a fast turnaround, such as real estate photography, or in my case, more high-end architectural work where I need to get my photos back to the client so they can see what I captured on site, they can make their selections of which photos they actually want to license from me, and that way I'm only doing the time-consuming high-end post-production work on the photos that they're actually licensing from me, and therefore the ones that they're paying me for. So without further ado, let's get into Lightroom and see this approach in action. So I'm going to share my editing process with these photos now, but normally what I'm going to be sharing with you, I'll be applying this as a preset when I bring these photos into Lightroom. So thus far, I appreciate that these do not look like a good set of photos. There's no real cohesion between these photos. The white balance is off. The exposure is not correct. And so that's what we're going to fix up real quick now. So I'm going to jump into the develop module and I'll leave auto sync on so that every change I make is applied to every single photo. And so I can't get too specific on individual photos. I need to work from a generic point of view whereby I'm going to try and improve all photos on a global level. And that's what you want to do when you build a preset is work from a global point of view. You can't build in things like white balance or geometric transformations that's specific to an individual photo. So everything we're going to do here will work globally for every photo. So first things first, let's apply a nice flat profile. Oh, how boring is that? Don't worry, we're gonna bring back that lovely contrast, but we're gonna do it ourselves. I normally like to bring my highlights down and boost my shadows up. I'll bring the whites up ever so slightly, and I also bring the blacks up. Now we have got an extremely flat and washed out image, but don't worry, this is where we're gonna grab the contrast slider and start pumping that back up. And the purpose of dropping the highlights and boosting the shadows and blacks is so that we're maximizing the dynamic range that we have available within our file, which is effectively compressing our tonal range. Our histogram is gonna get more bunched in the middle, as you can see here, but by grabbing that contrast slider, we're able to just stretch that back out. And that way, for the most part, highlights don't get blown out, shadows don't get lost, and we can get this proof back to our client nice and quickly. Normally for architecture, I feel we can be quite aggressive with the clarity, much more so than if you're working on something like portraits. A little bit of dehaze can be useful as well. And with the changes that we've made, usually we're starting to introduce a little bit too much saturation. And so I'm just gonna ease the saturation down a little bit and the vibrance as well, not too much so it gets washed out. But then I'm gonna jump into the color section and specifically into the yellows and oranges and just bring the saturation of those down. Because if you see a lot of the color casts that you get internally because of the tungsten style lighting, that's where our neutral whites and grays can often go into a kind of yellowy hue. And so by pulling those out, or at least reducing them, you can kind of control that overall look. Now we've dealt with color, I'm just gonna jump back into the tone curve. And I normally find that having made those adjustments that we did in the basic section, normally we can benefit by bringing up the mid-tones. I'll normally grab the highlights and just pull those out just a little bit so we're not getting overexposed and then bring the shadow section just down a little bit, just so that we're not pushing things too far. Color grading is an artistic choice and it's not something that I recommend for architectural photography, particularly not a preset that you want to work generically on most photos. So leave that well enough alone. Let's jump into the detail section though and how much sharpening you apply will depend on the resolution of your camera. Currently we've, we're sat at 40, I shot this at f11 on a tripod, so we're already pretty sharp, but I like to go uh, quite strong with this. Radius of 1.5, amount of 100, just so that those proof photos look really nice and crisp. At the reduced resolution size that I'm going to be sending the proofs back at, any noise that we've introduced by boosting up those shadows and the blacks is barely gonna be noticeable. But if you want to, you can introduce a little bit of luminance noise control. And for now, that's where I'm gonna leave that. But this next section, oh, this is so important. This, it, this is just gold. Uh, we wanna turn on remove chromatic aberration, which isn't gonna show us too much at the moment, but this is the main one, enable profile correction. I'm gonna click this and mm, isn't that so much better, uh, particularly in a file like this one here, where we had so much barrel distortion initially. If I turn this off, 
and put it back on. We've corrected the vignetting, the darkening around the corners, and geometrically, those lines are much, much straighter. Admittedly, the geometry, the angle of the lines isn't perfect, but that's something that I will control on an individual basis. The transform selection here is vitally important to architectural photography, but it's not something that you can apply globally or build into a preset, or I'd strongly advise against it. So thus far, everything that we've done up until now can be built into a preset. From here, this is where we put the finishing touches onto the individual photos. I say finishing touches, but I am purely talking about that from a proofing point of view. We do not need perfection at this point. We just want a good representation of what the image can look like so that the client can make that decision if they want it or not. All of the hard work of exposure blending, making sure we have a perfect white balance, potentially removing little dust spots like this, that all comes later. But what we can do is some quick fixes such as clicking on that neutral gray point, that's given me a much better white balance on this photo. And looking at the next three photos or next two photos, I know that I can actually synchronize that white balance across those two photos. So I'm gonna make sure that nothing else is synchronizing, but the white balance. Guys, if you missed the first part of this video series where I shared my organizational techniques of how I actually set up the stacks and rename these photos, then I'll link to that in the description below. So once you finish watching this, by all means, go there and check that out as well. Here we're gonna have a mixed color balance because we have the internal lights on. And so I'm just gonna find an area where I think we're gonna get a pretty neutral color balance. And I'm happy with that. But what I am absolutely not happy with is the keystoning effect that we've got of the vertical lines here. And so that absolutely needs correcting. And my favorite way to do that is with the guided tool. And I just draw a guide down the right hand side of the frame, find a line that should be vertical close to the left hand side of the frame and make a little refinement if I need to. And we can constrain the crop and that's going to get rid of that slight warping that we saw at the edges. And I've already made the decision that most of my vertical shots are going to be four by five. And so now I can reframe that as I want. And now I can move on to the next shot, which if I remember rightly, I didn't move my tripod. And so what I can do is just come to synchronize, select the transform option this time. We've still got white balance, which probably won't work for that. No, we've gone to blue on this one because at this point I've turned off that tungsten light. And so most of the illumination in here is coming from outside the window, much bluer light. And so let's just click to set a better white point for that. So it's pretty much as straightforward as that. We're literally clicking to set a more accurate white point and then coming down to transform and making sure that everything's nice and plumb. In the transform section, it's worth trying Lightroom's auto feature especially for the proof. Now, while the guided method is generally going to give you better results because you are in control of it, auto method, while not perfect, can sometimes give you a really quick fix like it has in this case. And that's good enough to go back to my client. Again, let's try auto here, see what job it does. That's pretty good. And again, come up, make sure that we've got the right white balance, choose something that should be neutral white. And if you come across individual images like this one where you feel like the highlights might be a little bit blown out, for example, you can always come in and make those fine adjustments. The same for the white balance as well. If you haven't quite nailed it, you can just make fine adjustments. But honestly, don't get caught up in the weeds at this point because it's just not worth it. The client may decide, I don't even like this frame. This isn't really what I'm after. And you will have wasted time that you really didn't need to. So just smash these photos out as quickly as you can. Get them back to the client and get paid. Now I have three vertical shots here. And as I said before, I actually want to shoot these or crop these as a four by five rather than the native three by two that my camera sensor is set to. If when I come to an image, I look at the edges of the frame and the verticals are pretty much running parallel with the edge of the photo, then I don't even worry coming into the transform section. All I'll do is just make sure that I'm happy with the white balance. Once I've done that, I move on. That's cooled this image off quite a lot and I did quite like that warm feeling that we had before. So I may just introduce a tickle of that and also just boost that exposure up. So we still have that nice internal lighting going on, but things aren't pushing to black around the edges. In this shot, we've got an obvious tilt downwards from the camera and that's giving us that quite strong keystoning effect. And I'm not shooting this on a tilt shift lens. I don't need to. A client has never said to me, oh, where's your tilt shift lens? Or did you correct that in post-production rather than on site by twiddling knobs on a very expensive lens? I'm happy with the sharpness that I get out of my 16 to 35. My clients are happy with the results. And so for all the people who are real tilt shift snobs out there, oh, you need to get a tilt shift lens. No, no, I don't need to get a tilt shift lens. If you want to buy me one, be my guest. But until my client says to me, I'm not happy with this work unless it's shot with a tilt shift lens, I'm not even interested. 
and people who also say, well, you could have got that right in camera on site. The speed with which I can draw four lines down my frame or even click that auto button is so much quicker than trying to nail it in camera on site. Sometimes the homeowner just wants you in and out as quickly as possible. You don't want to inconvenience them. And so if you can get through your shoot quickly and then also quickly fix things up in post-production, why not? Not only that, if you're shooting things with a tilt shift lens, there's still no guarantee that you've got it right in camera. You still may need to be coming into Lightroom and making some fine adjustments to those edges of the frame. Anyway, every now and again, I love to just press the backslash key on my keyboard so that I can see a before and after and just see what an improvement I've made with such simple and quick changes. If I can bulk adjust a white balance, I will. So in this case, I know that these photos were all shot in exactly the same lighting conditions. And so I can just correct for one with the auto sync turned on and that will correct all of them. And if I'm not happy with that white balance, which in this case, I'm not really in love with it, we can just make a slight adjustment and that'll update all three. Same again here for the tap image or for you Americans out there, the faucet. And here's an example where I probably won't be able to get the white balance accurate because if I click for the back wall here, this is mainly illuminated by the artificial light. Whereas here we had the window just to the left and that's going to be pushing a lot of blue light in here. But I'm honestly not going to worry about that because that's something that I can look at later in Photoshop. These photos were shot in similar conditions, so it's worth at least selecting them all and giving it a try to see if we can actually match that white balance. Okay, that's not too bad. Again, to an architectural client, a shot like this is not deliverable. We've got a lot more blue light over on the left-hand side than on the right, but that's a pretty easy post-production fix, but it's not one that I'm prepared to waste time on because if you start worrying about little things like that, if you multiply that over the whole set of images, your time investment in getting these proofs back to your client is just gonna escalate and get away on you. As I said initially in the video when I showed you that other set of photos from another kitchen shoot I did, normally I'm able to turn around a set like this inside 30 minutes from download to fully exported proof. That may seem doubtful because this has taken a while, but I've been trying to explain as I go so that you guys will have the tools to basically implement these strategies. And if you've got some ideas of how you think that I could improve my own strategies, by all means, let me know. I feel that photography and life in general, we're always learning. We can learn off each other. And so if you feel that you've got a better way of doing something, by all means, please let us know in the comments and hopefully you can help us all out. When I'm working on the proof images, I try to avoid adding local adjustments purely because it is a time thing, isn't it? But in a case like this, I may well do that. Look, if we add a radial gradient just to darken down the edges of the frame, that's just going to help to add balance. So we can invert this mask to talk to the outside of this oval. However, there's always more than one way to skin a cat. So instead, what I'm going to do is actually overexpose the interior with the intention of grabbing the overall exposure and bringing that back down bringing it further down. So this is far from perfect, but if we look at our before and our after, before and after, we're now in a pretty good place to send this through to our client. I'll press G on the keyboard again so that we can see all of our images. And although we're pretty close with how things are, I still feel that there can be just a little bit of final finessing. And the quickest way to do that is just to select the images in the library module and then use quick develop. So for example, I feel like both of these images are slightly underexposed. And so with one click here, we're gonna boost those up by a third of a stop. And another click puts them at two thirds of a stop brighter. Nice, might even go one third of a stop brighter on this one. We can do the same with the temperature as well. If we think things are a little bit too blue, we can warm things up slightly. For example, this one looks just a little bit too blue. So I'll push the temperature to the right just with one click there. Again, a little bit too blue maybe. Looks okay, looks okay. Not too bad, perhaps a little dark. So again, boost that exposure. Yeah, I'm happy with that. A deliberately dark and moody lit shot there. Happy with that. Perhaps a little blue, warm the temperature up. Perhaps a little green, so let's actually drop some green out of the tint. Because we've got a few mixed color sources there, I'm not sure we're actually gonna win this one, so I might just leave that one alone. Perhaps a little too bright. Same for these two, slightly overexposed. Perhaps brighten these lights up a little bit. And control the highlights a little more in that one. And I'm gonna say I'm happy with all of those. And now we have a much more cohesive set of images ready to send back to our client that if I were not recording a video and explaining what I was doing, it shouldn't take more than about half an hour to achieve those results. And the longer you look at your proofs, the more you're gonna to want to fine tune them. 
like I'm messing around with the color balance there. Just leave well enough alone. That's good enough for our client to look at these and say, yes, I would like to buy this photo or no, that's not quite the right angle that I'm after. I hope this Lightroom workflow has been helpful to you with your architectural and real estate photography. If you want to learn more about some of the more high-end retouching and editing techniques that I use in my architectural photography, just let me know in the comments below some of the challenges that you are facing and I'll see what I can put together for you in future videos. Thank you so much for watching guys. I'll catch you in one of those videos.